there was a broadly held assumption that we could engineer, the Federal Reserve could engineer a soft landing. Is that starting to unravel a little bit now? Well, I think the downside risks to growth have certainly increased over the last couple of weeks. I think the main, you know, downside risk is is with respect to trade. We've seen an escalation in, um, in tensions between the U.S. and China again. You know, now the economic impact of the tariffs, for example, is you know that direct impact is is estimated to be relatively small. We think it's around three tenths of a percentage point. But I think the bigger and more important point here is that it's happening during a time when global growth as well as U.S. growth was already on a decelerating trend. Um, so the, the slowing uh, growth in China, that does spill over into the U.S. Um, and so that in that kind of background, when you create uncertainty, it just creates a, you know, kind of a broader environment where you could see a bigger deceleration. Through much of 2018, it didn't really spill over into the United States. Jerome, a sign in the last couple of weeks that it's starting to show up in the U.S. data. Yeah. To what degree do you think that will increase over the next couple of months? We'll see that more and more. Well, you've seen PMIs actually, you know, weaken at this point in time, and obviously growth, as Tiffany uh, mentioned, you know, sort of ebb at this point in time. Um, I think when you couple that with the, you know, increasing dis potentials for disruption, as we highlighted in the previous segment, you know, we have to be preparing for more volatility in the market. That's something that, frankly, PIMCO has been embracing for a better part of the past year, since early 2018. We said, pay attention to where we are in the economic cycle, focus on being differentiative in corporate credit, looking at uh, uh, simply uh, creating diversified portfolios. And admittedly, in fourth quarter of last year, some of that came to fruition. But we think that this is more of a secular type of situation, meaning over the next three to five years, volatility may persist as we prepare for disruptions that can, can, that can continue to occur at this point in if time. If it persists over the next three to five years, what do we know about the tolerance of the Federal Reserve just to allow that to play out? to allow volatility to come back without responding to it. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the Federal Reserve is, has done a good job of communicating that they are going to be quicker to react um, to any downside risks. Certainly when you have less capacity via your uh, your your policy rate to, to ease policy, that argues for more aggressive a, uh, action at the beginning when you think you could see some some downside risk. So I certainly think that the Fed is going to react if, if they do see some material um, a, a material negative tra trajectory in the U.S. economy. Um, you know, and on the other side, you know, if it, as we kind of do or if we do engineer a soft landing, I think certainly the Federal Reserve is going to be a little bit um, more tolerant to let it run. Um, they've said they want to you know try to uh, engineer. We're moving toward engineering higher inflation or allowing or tolerating higher inflation in the U.S. if it does occur. Um, you know, so that just suggests that, you know, on the upside of, of the, the economy, they're, they're going to be, um, you know, more, uh, more patient and just let it run. Well, let's talk about what this bond market is priced for right now. Several rate cuts, Tiffany. At the turn of the year, I think there was a view held by a lot of people that if the Federal Reserve didn't back away, it was a policy mistake. Are we moving towards a place where if the Federal Reserve doesn't cut rates, this market starts to see that as a policy error? Well, I mean, I, I certainly think it's possible. Um, you know, I, I mentioned some of the escalation in, in trade policy, and there's a lot of uncertainty around that. You know, I think this time around, the Federal Reserve is going to be looking to the equity market to try to understand how the, the fundamentals of the U.S. economy are behaving on a real-time basis. Um, you know, so in the past, people have looked at the equity market as affecting growth through this wealth effect. Um, well, maybe that's not the bigger, um, the more important piece here. Maybe the more important piece is the equity market is actually telling the Federal Reserve something um, you know, that the data hasn't come out to show yet. You know, so I think they certainly are going to be more reactive to, uh, you know, to equity market or just broader financial conditions tightening because it could be showing them something that they don't know yet. What do you think, Jerome? Yeah, ultimately, you have three, almost three rate hikes or three rate cuts priced into the scenario right now. The threshold for those rate cuts is actually fairly high in terms of the near-term uh, near term prognosis. That doesn't mean there isn't any rate cuts, but as data uh, is emitted, as equity markets flux, you know, effectively the Fed is going to be uh, taking that in, into account. So is it a near-term thing to expect three rate cuts? No, but over the foreseeable future, the Fed's clearly going to be reactive to both sides, to the downside and to the upside. Uh, right now, it seems to be a little bit overextended in the sense that having three rate cuts priced in seems to be, uh, seems to be uh, a little bit too much. But but at the same time, if you truly believe that a recessionary environment is near, defense wins championships. And that defense ultimately comes from owning hard duration, owning hard assets like U.S. Treasuries, creating diversified portfolios, and immunizing yourself from a lot of the risks in the marketplace through diversification. And those three components really allow investors to sort of you know, find ways 
find the light through the uncertainty and really uh, and really help to protect their capital along the way. And Jerome, that's certainly what investors have been doing over the last 12 months or so. We've seen a big repricing of two-year Treasury yields. Just what kind of downside are you looking for on a two-year Treasury yield at the moment? Well, right now it's fully priced you know, in terms of taking into account most of those three rate yeah. cuts at this point in time. Term premiums are increasingly negative. We've seen the three-month bill to 10-year spread move to a negative, uh, a negative spread about 10 basis points or so for the first time in a few decades. These are all in indicators of fears of recession that are that are closer than people would expect. So you want to be protective of that. The other, other side of this, what we've seen in the recent rates, uh, rate movements, is simply a relative value play. U.S. rates are relatively attractive compared to the rest of the world. And when you take that into consideration versus the Eurozone and other places that are infected with negative interest rate regimes, ultimately those situations mean people want to buy U.S interest rate exposure at this point in time. So once again, being at the front end of the U.S. yield curve, diversified portfolios, sort of immunizing yourself from these threats, you know, where you can effectively earn about 3% returns is actually pretty attractive at this point in time. Well, let's wrap it up with a dangerous question, Tiffany. The, the yield curve inversion, I imagine when people mention it in this building, a lot of people get shouted at. Is it different this time? Well, I mean, no one ever wants to say it's different this time. I mean, it has been um, kind of a home run indicator in the past of, of recession. Um, but I think there are uh, some important considerations with the yield curve, and that's that um, something that Jerome just said, US, the U.S. market, um, U.S. Treasury yields are still um, a good place for yield. So if you have weakness in the rest of the world, investors are going to go and, and invest in, in the relatively safe Treasury market. So some of the, the yield curve inversion that we've seen could be reflecting some just broader weakness and fundamentals in the rest of the the world instead of the U.S. in particular. Um, you know, and the other thing is, is certainly central banks have taken a lot of, uh, you know, they bought a lot of bonds, which should uh, compress yields, yeah. you know, all else equal. You know, so I think, I think those things would, you know, would sort of argue that, you know, maybe the U.S. is not on the precipice of recession, even though we are getting that, that inverted yield curve.